From 11FS, this is Fintech Insider News, and I'm your host, Ross Gallagher. This week's guests have just said goodbye after a really great show. We're taking on some of the biggest stories in the industry right now, including Tech Nation's shutdown, Spark's fears for UK fintech. Uh, Yeah, lots of sadness around this one, so make sure you listen to what our panels had to say. Uh, Stripe tells employees it will decide on an IPO within the next year. See what our panel thinks about whether that's going to happen. And six-year-old boy spends $1,000 on Grubhub, and he's buying us all lunch. We get into all of this and much more. But first, a few brief messages. Don't go anywhere. Heads up, people. We've got a brand spanking new report dropping very soon. The 11FS Pulse Report 2023 will officially land later this month. What were the best fintech user journeys of 2022? Which UX trends are set to take the new year by storm? All of this will be answered and more with winning insights from our 11FS Pulse team experts and global industry leaders. Go to info.11fs.com slash pulse dash report to download and to find out more. That's info.11fs.com slash pulse dash report. We can't wait to share what we've been working on. Hello and welcome, LFG people, to Fintech Insider. Blockchain Insider. 11FS Spotlight. 11FS Explores. Open mic night. After dark. Through our podcasts, videos, newsletters, and live events, we have a direct line to a truly global fintech community. So if you're looking to sponsor and collaborate on content that connects with everybody from fintech beginners to the biggest VCs, then chat to our team at sponsors at 11fs.com or visit 11fs.com to find out more. Long live the community. Hello and welcome to episode 703 of Fintech Insider. I'm Ross Gallagher and I'm joined this week on Fintech Insider News by some great guests to break down this week's biggest stories in fintech and financial services. Firstly, it's my wonderful 11FS co-host, Kate Moody. Uh, Kate, it's good to have you here. Um, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing, doing pretty well, yeah. Exciting week so far. Yeah, good. Anything you can tell us about? Uh, I'm working on imagining the future of pensions, which is half like really exciting and half really bleak because my own pension is in dire straits. So that's been an interesting up and down journey for me so far. I'll bet. Well, look, I can't wait to see what comes out of that one. Um, As well as Kate, we have a welcome return to Fintech Insider for Tom Rennick, Head of Business Lending at Adam Bank. Um, Tom, welcome back to the show. Thanks for joining us. Maybe you can just remind our audience about uh, you and your role at Adam. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Um, so, uh, yeah, head of uh, business lending Atom Bank. So, uh, effectively, I'm accountable for the, the design, development, and, and day-to-day uh, financial performance of our business lending propositions. Nice, Tom. Well, listen, great to have you. Thanks for joining us. And last, but by no means least, we have another return to FinTech Insider for Douglas McKenzie, the Chief Content Officer for FinTech Finance. Uh, Douglas, welcome back also. Um, what's got you excited in FinTech for the first uh, first couple of months of 2023? Oh, thanks for having me back, um, Kate and Ross. Um, For me, I think it only just came out yesterday or today. JP Morgan is moving Chase over to Germany as well. So, I mean, that's obviously going to be coming in in 2025, but huge news that the big American giants are really moving across, you know, the whole of Europe, really. It's going to be quite exciting. So that's, that's got me fired up. Yeah, absolutely one to watch, and they're going great guns um, in the UK. So one to watch here as well. I think over the next uh, the next few months. Um, yeah, so Douglas, great to have you. Listen, thanks for joining us and, and jumping on to share your insights. So um, with that, let's uh, let's jump right in. Let's get into the news. So our first story comes from Sifted, uh, with the headline that Tech Nation is shutting down as UK government controversially pulls key funding. So Tech Nation, the UK startup organisation that helped bring thousands of talented tech workers to the UK, has announced that it will cease operations in March after the UK government pulled key funding. Tech Nation has worked with nearly a third of the country's 122 unicorns since 2011 and ran the UK's Global Tech Talent Visa. Though it was never a government organisation, Tech Nation was a key player in advancing the nation's agenda to become a global startup hub and its existence depended on government funding. 
In September last year, it was reported that the UK's Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, or DCMS, has decided to give that £12 million of grant funding, which Tech Nation had relied on, to Barclays Bank. That decision was confirmed this month, and Tech Nation will now cease operations at the end of March. For some further context, we reached out to Jared Grech, CEO of Tech Nation, to ask what comes next for the UK startup and scale-up ecosystem. In terms of what's next, I would say that we're at a generational high point in terms of startup creation, and the market continues to develop and mature. However, there continues to be no single organization in the ecosystem which focuses on tech scale-ups as Tech Nation does. Scale-ups really go on to create over 90% of the UK tech jobs and really drive productivity and also attract investment. And this is where really Tech Nation has focused on and and we've seen scale-ups disproportionately thrive. The team and I are really proud of the fact that whilst 80% of startups fail within the first few years, over 90% of the startups on Tech Nation's growth programs have gone on to scale. So, so now it's a question of how do we capture that moment and seize the day and do more? You know, more needs to be done. The government has announced its ambitions to be a forward-facing science superpower and hopes to take on Silicon Valley and to become one of the most innovative countries in the world. Silicon Valley for me is, is obviously a, ge- a geographical place, but it's also a mindset. And that mindset is one of innovation and being able to kind of overcome challenges and dealing with failure and just continuing going, whatever happens. And I don't think we are, the UK is necessarily just, it shouldn't just look at Silicon Valley, it should look to Shenzhen and New York and Bangalore. I mean, these are very, very fast growing hotspots for technology, talent and innovation. So I look forward to that. Yeah, some some really interesting insights there. Douglas, maybe I'll come to you first on this one. I mean, obviously a a, a big story this week. Maybe the the writing's been on the wall um, for some time, but certainly the conversations I've had with people about this story, I I think it's been a universally sad reaction. I think people really lamenting the gap now that's going to be left by Tech Nation. What was was your reaction to this story? Yeah, I I think there's a twofold one. Obviously, it's really sad that uh, an organisation of this calibre is being effectively put to pasture. But then also it's the future, um, you know, the lamentation for the future and the fact that, um, as you mentioned, Ross, they also handle the the visa, the global talent visa applications. And I imagine if you're going through a, a situation of moving country, moving house, moving job, and you're working with that company directly to facilitate that move, that very stressful move, suddenly knowing that they're moving on, that organization isn't functioning anymore. Where does that put you? And suddenly, again, you know, you're drawing parallels with Brexit. There's so much question up in, up in the air where you're like, okay, well, the government has moved in this direction, but is there any more kind of feedback to know, okay, this is what's going to happen in the interim. And I think, again, just seeing flashbacks of that. So I think, yeah, it's just universal industry kind of. Uh, melancholy really yeah and it's such it's such an excellent point actually about the uncertainty right because it's sort of like layering uncertainty into what is already a really uncertain climate um which isn't doing anybody any favors and i think you know when you look at um tech nation and we touched on like some of its successes in in helping company scale and actually defying many of the statistics that typically affect um, early stage startups, um, they've obviously had a huge influence. So, Kate, I'm interested in your thoughts. Is this, is this? I hate to say it, but another example of maybe this government um, shooting the UK and its prospects in the foot. I think it's hard to not have that as your instinctive first reaction. And um, I think I probably had the same uh, first impression as you when I first saw this story. You feel kind of very sad because because of the impact that Tech Nation has had. You know, you try to dig around beneath the surface a bit to try and understand what's what's motivated them to take this money away from Tech Nation. You're given that amazing list of your graduate graduates and things like that. Like you know, what what has driven this? And it's hard to hard to think that it's not just about the money. It sounds like Barclays have sort of co-invested with the government with this. You know, they've said that 
their their version of this offering will Barclays will cover the people and operational costs. So you can sort of see from the government's perspective that it makes sense to try and deploy limited you know, in a time of economic restrictions to try and find the most effective way to deploy this money using the private system to try and increase the reach. You know, Barclays obviously have so sort of that regional coverage or that's certainly something that they've highlighted in their statements. So yeah, I'm trying to kind of not be just solely critical. You know, I think there probably are quite practical drivers in this decision as as well. Um, but it's it's very, very difficult to to see Tech Nation just disappear given the amount of success they've had. You know, I look at the list of alumni that have come through their their courses and their support systems, you know, obviously in FinTech, but also in UK tech more broadly, you know, Monzo, Revolut, Bloom and Wild, Ocado, Skyscanner, Delivery. Like <laughs> these are basically all the businesses that run my life. <laughs> so um I feel like I owe them individually quite a sort of debt of gratitude for helping me kind of feed myself and manage my money and also buy last minute panicked gifts for relatives that I'd forgotten about. So um yeah, it's it's really, really difficult. And you really hope that Barclays will will step up and and try and match what they're doing at the moment through Technation. Actually, speaking to Kate's point, it actually took me quite a long time of uh, quite a bit of digging to find the government's response as to why. And it, it was almost, uh, Kate, to your point, it was just, I think they said it, it represented the best value for taxpayers' money. Um, but when you look at success, that, you know, with the, the companies that you mentioned, it's hard, it's a hard thing to, to toss up. Yeah. And, and look, uh, Tom, something I'm really keen to get your thoughts on, right? Because I think Kate and Douglas raise a really interesting point, right? I mean, public finances are stretched. You can understand it from the value perspective, right? And maybe it's the right thing for the government. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right thing for fintechs or the right thing for the industry. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, you know, Tech Nation was a, a global exemplar of excellence in how to create and, and maintain a startup ecosystem. Um, you know, their team strive to create better outcomes, you know, build better businesses, and that's served, you know, both the UK and international markets. And, you know, Atom, we, we wholeheartedly wish them all the best, and it'll be interesting to see if the, the glass slipper fits anyone else's model. I think, you know, there's a real danger that the progress in the last decade is, is threatened by some of the macroeconomic trends we see at the moment. You know, valuations are down, startups are struggling for funding. Um, jobs across the industry are being lost, and there probably is a, a vacuum of progressive policies and support for technology companies, um, especially in the wake of, of Brexit. And I completely have to echo some of the pragmatic uh, rationale that has probably driven the decision. Um, but I equally ask myself how, how Barclays not conflicted on this. You know, would Barclays have promoted and nurtured a Monzo or Revolut in the same way that a, a tech nation have? Um, yeah, I'm reminded of the the economist kind of Milton Friedman, which, which is you know there's there's only one social responsibility of business, and that's to to engage and use its resources to to increase shareholder profitability. Um, should we should we be handing I suppose the keys to our startup ecosystem to one of the largest banks? I, I'm I'm not sure. Um, the jury's very much out. Yeah, it was interesting on that point, Tom. You know, when I looked at the Barclays statement, you know, Barclays have kind of come out and said you know, very, very openly, you know, it's, it's not a requirement to bank with Barclays to access the programs, which, you know, I can imagine from, from the outside might, you, know, you might be like, okay, well, that's great. Like you don't have to bank with them, so they must be independent. Um, but yeah, as you say, it's really more about, are they going to be invested in driving that competition? Um, you know, they've talked about having robust monitoring processes and all these things, which I imagine on a sort of government application form, probably tick a box and, and seem sensible, but it really, it's about that that real world experience of of driving change, challenging industry norms, trying to set up new business models, new ways of of, of commercialising this this industry, and is Barclays? I, I share your your scepticism about whether Barclays are are going to be invested in disrupting the industry more broadly. Um, we know that you know, the Barclays team themselves do a, do a ton of great work. I mean, we have quite a few people in the 11FS team who who are from Barclays and have worked in some of these innovation programs internally. So it's not to say that Barclays aren't trying to innovate and, and don't do great stuff, but it just feels like a, a a really difficult balance to strike to try and drive your own business forward and also to drive forward challenges to your business. Yeah, I it's, it's a challenging one, isn't it? And look, of course, there's been um, a huge response from sort of fintechs, almost all of it negative, right-handing 
the keys for the future of the the sort of tech and, and financial services disruption space to you know what is I agree with you, Kate. They're doing amazing things, but a well-established incumbent player. Um, Douglas, final word to you on this one. How do you think it's going to affect those prospects, sort of moving forward? And how do you how do you think it's going to affect the UK standing as a real leader um, in the the sort of fintech space as it has been for a number of years? A big question. I, I, I yeah. I to my earlier point, I, I'm nervous for for the long term. Um, we're seeing very, very agile regions around the world deploy similar things. I was lucky enough to be sent over to the, uh, to Hong Kong to see what they were doing by encompassing Shenzhen, Guangzhou and Hong Kong into this kind of regional hyper hub of technology. Um, I think, yeah, France and Amsterdam have done massively well, um, you know, in the, in recent years when it comes to fintechs. So, I know it's like at this time where we need stability and to be able to kind of just move along in the same direction because those numbers don't lie. They're very impressive. Um, it seems slightly nervous, I think is the best way to put it is, is really why at this time. So would we have had a Monzo if Barclays team were looking after it? As you mentioned, I'm not sure. What does that mean? What will we miss in the future? That's a scary thought. Yeah, well, look, I think we can only really applaud um, the the successes and the great work that's happened under Tech Nation. And I think really we're all sort of rooting for Barclays and obviously the future of the, the sector. So we can only really wish them well. Um, all right, with that, I'm going to move us on to our next story, which comes from City AM with a headline, Oak North and Atom Bank call on grant shops to boost lending to small businesses. So the Federation of Small Businesses, the FSB, and a group of top fintech firms, including Oak North and Atom Bank, have called on the UK Secretary of State for Business Grant Shaps to improve small businesses' access to borrowing. The group have warned that failure to do so could further damage the UK's economic growth prospects. The business lobby and a number of fintech lenders have warned that smaller firms are often shut out of traditional borrowing routes due to complex and fragmented data requirements. In a letter seen by City AM, the fintech firms, which also include Funding Circle, Kodat and iWalker, have written to the business secretary to ramp up data sharing initiatives and lean on the UK's open banking regime to ease the process of borrowing for smaller firms. Before we go to the panel, let's hear from Gabby McSweeney, Head of Communications and Public Policy at Kodat, the company which put this open letter together. Kodat has joined forces with a group of small business lenders and open finance advocates, including Funding Circle, iWalker, Atom Bank, Alica Bank, Recognise and Oak North, to write an open letter to the business secretary, Grant Shapps, calling for the government to support improved data sharing initiatives to tackle the difficulties faced by SMEs in accessing credit. The letter asks for the government to legislate for an SME funding passport, a digital file containing company financial data necessary for underwriting, which is consented, standardised and easily shareable with lenders in real time. This goes beyond just bank account data and includes relevant data from any of an SME's connected financial tools, such as accounting software. The proposal is based on research that Kodak did in 2022, which showed that 47% of UK SMEs in need of a loan have difficulty getting one, and just 6% are satisfied with the current SME credit market. Sharing data instantly with multiple financial service providers would ensure quicker applications for the small business with higher likelihood of success. It would also decrease application processing times, helping lenders offer more competitive rates and service more loans. At Kodak, we work with more than 100 credit providers to incorporate digital data into their lending processes. And so we've seen the possible benefits firsthand. Now that the open banking roadmap has been marked complete, we must urgently move forward to the next stage of open finance. And in our opinion, solutions like this that tackle a specific problem for a critical segment of the economy are the most meaningful and effective way to do that. Tom, listen, as, as, as one of the signees of this letter, I think it makes, uh, it makes sense to come to you first on this one. Um, interested sort of just in your thoughts generally and uh, what, what, what sort of triggered sending this letter now? Yeah, so I mean, if we we take it back to first principles, you know, there are roughly five and a half million small and medium sized businesses in the UK. They're an engine for growth. They employ sixty percent of the private sector workforce. They contribute close to half of UK GDP. But when they seek finance, the majority can consider only one bank. It's usually their current account provider. If they go elsewhere, their, their chances of being rejected are typically fifty percent higher. 
And if you look at kind of British business bank data, and, and this has been you know, a thing for a while now, uh, you know, six in ten would rather resort to, to, to uh, using personal funds to, to fund business expansion instead. You know, seventy percent of UK small businesses would rather you know, grow more slowly than than borrow. You know, perpetual non-borrowers, they're, they're termed. And it's a colossal market failure, and it, it's fundamentally as well because of two uh, data asymmetries. You know, the first uh, information asymmetry exists because the borrower knows more about their business prospects than the potential lender, and it makes the loan a risky proposition. And you could say, yeah, that's true for every loan, and that's right, but it's particularly acute in business lending where you don't have homogenous business models. So small firms, um, the likes that Gabby just talked through there, often they're young, they have a thin credit history, and it's inherently more risky. The second is because their existing current account provider kind of better observe cash flows, balances an existing loan performance. And it therefore has a, a competitive advantage over other lenders. And it's something that if you hark back to the 2016 CMA investigation, we were talking about then, and you know, six, seven years down the line, it's still a problem. Open banking has demonstrated that with the right permissions, you know, sensitive financial data can be shared securely and permissioned with, with third party providers using APIs. And I think you know, the reason Atom and others have sent this letter is that we believe a, a similar permission data sharing standards could be rolled out across the economy in some kind of open data platform or open data passport. More small businesses would be able to harness the power of their data to, to access the finance that they need fundamentally to grow. Yeah, one of, I think one of the, the, the most sort of um, pertinent points, Tom, that you made in there was we've been banging the drum on this. The industry's been banging the drum on this. SMEs have been banging the drum on it for a really long time, right? And, and and we still, the picture hasn't really improved. I mean, it, SMEs are, are fundamentally underserved across every element of financial services, but especially when it comes to finance, I mean, simply getting a yes or a no can take months, right? And there's lots of reasons um, behind that. But I mean, Kate, you know, this is this is a massive issue and, and, and I'm, I'm sure one that, that you recognize and can identify with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think definitely the, the points Tom has raised about the the lack of transparency in the system, like that 100% rings true of what I've heard when I when I speak to SMEs as part of the work that we do. You know, the SMEs that we, especially at that sort of earlier stage of the spectrum, just don't have the time to make an application that has the, you know, the low levels of success that, that Tom talked about. So, you know, it's it's not sort of apathy or laziness on on their parts that some people kind of like to like to sort of put it down to like it's it's really sort of just a pragmatic if you've got any hope in hell of, of getting lent to with the time that you've got the resources you've probably got available to kind of process that and make that decision at the moment there aren't the tools there to to help you do that outside of your your current provider um, so I definitely think the types of you know, technology changes that this letter is calling for would make a significant difference um, you know I also think maybe it links back to the the tech nation story as well because you know, we talk about those those perpetual non borrowers that Tom highlighted. I'm sure there are like a, you know, a chunk of those people who are not borrowing for very very valid reasons. But there's a probably substantial group of them who who should be able to grow through through accessing credit. And I think a large part of that is probably a lack of access to to the types of advice and guidance that it sounds like the the likes of Tech Nation were providing to those those fintech scale ups. So actually, it's kind of about the the infrastructure to help you get credit, but also the support network that you have when you don't have a CFO, when you probably can't afford to have you know, financial experts in your business, to people to help you understand what type of borrowing should you be looking for? Like what type of credit should you be accessing? How much should you be borrowing over what length of time? All those things are really, really difficult decisions for people to make and probably help probably put them off credit as well. So I think it's probably a combination of technology and also you know, advice and guidance. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting point, and I think the parallels um, tying it back to the previous story, right? In I'd go even further in terms of like, actually, again, are we sort of fundamentally, and maybe Douglas, I'll I'll, I'll throw this question to you, but you know, Tom gave the example of, of of businesses actually having to choose to grow more slowly rather than having to go through the pains of actually getting the credit that would allow them to actually grow more quickly and scale. Um, like, is the industry, is the market, are we just fundamentally failing small businesses in the UK? And again, to our detriment, right? Because I think Tom made the point as well that they're the very backbone of the entire economy and critical to our, our sort of economic success. Yeah, um, I guess we probably are at this point, but I think it's been highlighted because of the successes in the financial 
system in the fact that a lot of these SMEs have had a very successful time using banks like Atom and other you know, financial providers in this digital space and wanted to have the same experience with their small medium enterprise um, and suddenly thought, oh, why can't I get the same tools that I've had access to over my phone for my business? So I think currently as is, probably because the market, as we've discussed already on this conversation, it's so hard to gauge what the demands are for maybe a sole trader all the way up to a, a medium enterprise that has you know, a thousand employees. And to find that niche, I think the digital organizations do need to step in. And we've seen the successes with open banking in the retail banking space. So hopefully let the floodgates open, you know, the, uh, the hands of war fly and, uh, see where it can go in the future. I, I think that I think that you've hit the nail on the head there, haven't you? Because when you think about SMEs, yes, it's a nice, neat sort of term that we can bucket everything into, but actually the reality is that they're incredibly diverse. Like you said, everything from a sort of like one-man band, sole trader type, through to, like you said, hundreds or, or even a thousand employees. So what I think is interesting is actually the there's as much sort of challenges as, SMEs face as there almost are SMEs themselves, right? And I think actually the offerings, particularly as we see them from the high street lenders, are still super generic. And I guess that's sort of part of the problem. So maybe, Tom, coming back to you on this one, I guess, what do you hope is the response to this letter and, and, and sort of what are you hopeful for in terms of where, where we go from here as an industry? Yeah, I mean, you know, success ultimately will require a joint effort from both the public and private sector. But I think you know, the UK... Uh, has demonstrated with open banking that we can be a world leader in enabling permission data portability. I think you know, back to the previous story as well, we need to be really careful that we don't fall behind key competitors in our ability to, to lead global debates on future data governance. I think you know, the EU in particular, the last two or three years, some of the legislation and consultation papers that they have over there, you know, inherently much more progressive than, than what we're looking at here. Um, and so you know, I think we're, you know, we're calling on Grant Shapps and, and uh, you know, the FCA as well to to have a look and revisit some of the um, the work you know, the PRA did with the Bank of England back in, in 2020. Uh, they've published a white paper then, which was broadly well received and has kind of sat on a shelf since. Yeah, and, and actually, again, so really want to um, close up on picking up on your point, and maybe Kate, I'll throw this one over to you. You know, how much of this is linked to or how much of an issue is what we've seen this week, headlines coming out about the UK falling behind as a market leader in open banking? You know, everything that sort of Tom is talking about in terms of data sharing relies on having something like that in place. But you look at markets like Australia and India and Brazil, and they're really starting to move ahead of the UK now, which is worrying. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's very hard, I think, across all different industries and technologies right to maintain a market leading position like obviously people who are innovating in the space behind you can can learn from you and, and I think a credit to the UK from what I've seen we have been very open about partnering with other parts of the world to kind of share we what it's taken to get our system up and running and, and they've probably undoubtedly noticed things which inevitably were less efficient or could have been done better. And so it, it feels natural that other parts of the world, as they roll out their, their takes on it, will do things differently and do things better. But it is concerning that, yeah, you do sort of get this vibe that we're just sort of resting on our laurels a little bit and be like, oh, we got to there. That's all good. We can stop now. And you know, really, to, to Tom's point, it, there's still so much more for for us to do. Um, and to your point about the diversity of the SME or SMB, depending on where you are in the world, um, space I think is that I'm worried that we're going to really start to see a split as well between those sort of digitally underpinned businesses like those e-commerce businesses which are starting to see a, a greater variety of lending solutions because to Tom's point so much of that business transactional data is easily available is easily shareable um, you know we, we look at the likes of Wayfly, for example, and they're doing some really interesting stuff with those those e-commerce type businesses. And you worry that the the sector kind of gets split and there's SMEs that do have more options and do have more choice and potentially those less digital 
businesses get get left behind and, and forgotten because it's a constant scramble for for time and focus and energy when it when it comes to innovating and and you know, creating policies Tom said so that's my concern is that we we see this split and those SMEs which are still a fundamental part of our economy but maybe not sexy e-commerce businesses get get left behind and forgotten when they shouldn't be yeah no look completely agree and um I think the letter is timely and look we can only hope that um it does sort of agitate the right response and um, that things pick up from here. All right, um, we are just going to take a very quick pause here and we'll be back with you very shortly. Here at 11FS, we believe in explaining FS without the BS. That's why we created our 11FS Explore series, weekly videos that break down a complicated financial services topic into something everyone can get their head around, such as... On Rampy. Buy now, pay later. The cost of living. ESG. Stable points. Telematics insurance. And inclusive design. Search 11FS Explores on YouTube now. Welcome back to the show. Before we get on to the next half of today's news, a reminder to go check the latest episode of our FinTech Insider Insight sister show. Our very own Kate is joined by guests from Onward, Winnie and Nosso to talk about the financial services targeted at parents right now, the challenges in this space and what the future might hold. Uh, A recording that Kate almost missed because of her own childcare issues, which is (laughs) deeply ironic. Lots of Um, ambient toddlers, I think, in the background of that one. So Excellent. That's what you want to hear. All right, go check that out wherever you got this podcast. Cue it up after this one. All right, let's get into our next story. Uh, So this one comes from CNBC. Uh, The headline is Stripe tells employees it will decide on an IPO within the next year. So Stripe, the fintech company once valued at $95 billion by private market investors, will make a decision on its plans to go public within the next year. Co-founders and brothers John and Patrick Collison told employees that they will set a goal of taking the company public or letting staffers sell shares through a secondary offering. In July, Stripe cut its internal valuation by 28% from $95 billion to $74 billion. Earlier this month, the information reported that Stripe again lowered its valuation to $63 billion. Stripe is considering a direct listing or private market transaction and has hired Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan to advise on the deal. So, uh, Kate, I'll come to you first on this one. What were your uh, what were your thoughts? What was your reaction? I'm intrigued to know like how they're working with both Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan. Like that must be a fun a fun table to to be around. With, like Stripe in the middle and Goldman on one side worrying them and JP Morgan on the other. So. That was kind of my first reaction. I kind of wanted to wanted to eavesdrop on that, but um, yeah, I suppose there's probably a, a, a more sophisticated point to try and make about yeah you know, whether this is showing signs of the IPO market thawing. You know, it's obviously been a difficult time for IPOs. We had a, a fairly significant bounce during the COVID pandemic, sort of two record breaking years whilst we were all shut up in our houses. But you know, this is being described, I think fairly broadly as one of the worst IPO markets in more than a decade. So a lot of people are definitely hoping that Stripe will will, will get the ball rolling again, so to speak. Um and, you know, obviously it would be a huge event if they did, given given the scale of the business and, and the size of the business. And and even though that valuation has has dropped, it's still, you know, not a shabby valuation. And then there's obviously a lot of people who have shares who will be desperate to to capitalize on those. So yeah, we just hear constant drip drip drips of, of rumors so it feels like it's kind of a persistent theme but um i guess we'll only know once once goldman sachs and jp morgan decide what to do yes no exactly um douglas what do you think i mean do you think that this is this is the the big uh the big ipo to to sort of reignite uh reignite the market as kate said I mean, they are the kind of what the, the fintech golden boys, really, um, in that regard. So if there was a company to do it, especially, um, for instance, after what you saw with Deliveroo, you know, going back to our first story as well here in the UK, where, um, it will be interesting because of, of the prestige there. But I mean, after, I think it was, it was 2021, wasn't it? The, the real, crazy one when, with that, you know, IPOs and then that re, reevaluation. Will it just be a natural progression to slowly march its way back up to where things were pre-pandemic or during pandemic? 
I, I literally actually have no idea, but it'd be very interesting to see if I'd, I'd love to see if this kickstarts it. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting point about the valuation, and it it you know it doesn't appear to be a, a blip. I mean, we've seen other uh, Klarna and and Monto and others um, you know take down rounds. Um, Tom, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think uh, this is a, a larger scale sort of market correction, or do you think there's uh, there's headway here for uh, Stripe to increase that valuation as they head towards that? that IPO or that event? Well, I think if you compare Stripe to, to public fintech uh, equities broadly, which some of which have suffered you know, 60, 80% drops in value over the last 12 to 18 months, including some of their you know, primary competitors, you know, PayPal and Square, you know, I think a, a private raise at you know, I think 60 billion is one of the figures being branded around would comparatively be a, a victory. You know, there's, that's still a, I think a 20 times revenue multiple in an environment where many fintechs are trading in single digits. But I think it goes back to you know what Douglas was saying. You know, Stripe doesn't lose money on every transaction. They're, they're, they're only unprofitable right now due to its operating expenses, and, and they're working on that. It's a fantastic business. It would certainly be the most hotly anticipated fintech IPO and, uh, and could get the ball rolling again. Yeah, listen, I completely agree. And you know, Douglas described Stripe as the sort of fintech golden boy in this context, and I completely agree. Obviously, one of the highest valuations. And I think actually this this IPO has been hotly anticipated, Tom, as you say, for for quite some time. So, Kate, why now? Why, like, what's kind of what's kind of driving this? Um, I mean, it's we're not in the company, right? Like, I think these are decisions that get made for all sorts of reasons. You know, whether that's driven by the founders themselves, whether that you know, there's been quite a lot of chat i think about you know certain key individuals either like you know, senior employees or members of you know, stripes board or investors like, agitating to you know, they've put the money in and they've helped to support that growth either financially or, or kind of through the work that they're doing with the business and people want to want to be able to get value out of that so it's it's i think it is a difficult um potential decision maybe to make about how much you you tie your employee and sort of investor incentivization to to that i mean it's if your employees are 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 really being retained because of that hope of your ipo then the longer you put it off then obviously you've got to manage that not just financially but also culturally with within your business as well um you know tom i know that you know, mark the ceo from atom came on and talked very frankly and, and very honestly about the the decisions that you guys have had to weigh up as a business about about your own plans to potentially go public. So what what impact has, has that had? I'd be, be intrigued to get your perspective from from being in that and experiencing that directly. Yeah, I mean, you know, the issue now is obviously that marketing conditions are unfavorable. And with an economic outlook that's still turbulent, it's, it's difficult to put precise dates on it. And I think you know companies are, are anxious to get the timing right and don't want to be held hostage to, you know, to fortune. Um, I think you know, when Mark was on here, uh, he said, you know, quite rightfully that time is good. Everyone want, wants more time to, to plan, to improve. And I think, you know, we look at it very much as an opportunity to, to grow. And so when that time comes, the business is in a better place. And, you know, hopefully that's that's um, supported in the valuation. But you need, you know, to your point, shareholders with the, the resources and appetite to uh, support a business through that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And look, it's, it's that sort of... Um... I guess that's that's what we're seeing now with the sort of those market dynamics shifting is actually maybe maybe that type of support um, is 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 really what's in uh, what's in short supply. One thing that I want to sort of um, maybe pick your brains on, Douglas, is you know we we still even now actually spend a lot of time talking about these valuations, and you know it's always they're they're sexy headlines, and I totally get it. Um, you know, do you feel that there's actually a little bit too much significance that are being put on these valuation figures, especially in the context where we've seen sort of layoffs and all of that sort of stuff? Yeah, it it kind of bends the mind, doesn't it? Because we talk about it almost in total in the fact that it's how you view all these fintech companies that we deal with. Oh, they're valued like that. Oh, they must be worth that much. When obviously, as we've mentioned, a lot of these companies still aren't profitable, for instance, or anything like that. And so suddenly when you apply that that spin on it, it really changes the whole narrative. And I think it's it's 
kind of strange that we have these numbers and we then all apply the same kind of valuation on that. I know everyone has their kind of um, differences to a point, um, but maybe the fintech industry as a whole needs to start looking at these numbers less and looking at the actual problems that these companies solve and what they can solve, but maybe more importantly, what they are solving currently. Um, and yeah, I think that means maybe the fintech industry is a bit guilty of not doing that. I think there's um there's kind of, I can understand in a way why we do do it, right? Because everyone loves numbers. Everyone loves to be able to kind of stack things side by side and kind of say like, oh, like who's doing better? Like who's winning? And that's kind of just a bit of an innate thing that we have. And because these, I mean, the majority of these fintechs historically have not been profitable, which is kind of the other number that people like know and like to compare, then I think we have skewed more and more towards valuations as a way of of, of doing our sort of comparisons. But yeah, as I'm sure we'll touch on later on the show, you know, we are now starting excitingly to see more of these fintechs get to or approach profitability. So I'm I'm hopeful that maybe we'll start to see a more nuanced conversation about you know, valuations, but for the companies that have reached profitability or are about to reach profitability, like the different paths that they're taking to get to that and the different business models that they're deploying and how they combine that with the impact that they're having for their customers. And I think you know, that will hopefully get, to us, get us to a space where we can like play our numbers game, but also play the real world, like what impact are we having game to? Yeah, I really like your point about um, a more nuanced conversation around valuations and maybe one that um, is more based on sort of strong business fundamentals rather than maybe projected future success. Um, and actually, for me, this is a nice segue into our next uh, our next story, which comes from the Financial Times, um, with a headline, Republicans vowed to probe US banks and asset managers' ESG agenda in Congress. So banks and asset managers will face scrutiny from Congress on their ESG agenda, according to a senior Republican lawmaker in the U.S. This points to tensions ahead between the new House majority and America's financial sector. The comments by Andy Barr, the chair of the House Financial Services Subcommittee, responsible for financial institutions and monetary policy, are aimed at Wall Street banks and asset managers for their social and climate goals. The Kentucky lawmaker said in an interview in his office on Capitol Hill, we think that banks should be non-political. Banks should not be a political party. Banks should serve creditworthy borrowers and focus on earnings and profitability for their shareholders. Barr added that his concern was that America's financial system had been co-opted, this is a quote, co-opted by the intolerant left that is intolerant of diversity. Now, I read this kind of story and I throw my hands in the air and I I roll and I just think, what? What? However, I've been told that I need to take maybe a slightly less antagonistic line. Um, I'm going to, Kate, I'm going to come to you in the first instance. I mean, look, I think the implication here is they're linking ESG essentially to sort of climate change and progressive political movements more generally and maybe suggesting that Wall Street has become a little bit too woke. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I don't think if we'd played like a sort of spontaneous word association game, you would have got woke off most people when you started citing some of these big American institutions. Um, You know, we have seen the likes of BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, Fidelity Investments publicly embrace so-called sustainable investing. Um, But really, I think, I don't really feel that's come from a sort of, what what was the phrase, Uh, you know, co-opting by the left. I think it's more that these are big institutions that are trying to create products that their customers want. And what we're increasingly seeing is that the demand for, you know, financial products, which, you know, are secure and are safe and make you a profit, but are also not breaking the world or fueling conflict and, and disaster generally, you know, there is there is demand for that. Um, and I think that's obviously where you know, it seems like there's a big gap. You know, the, the, the Republican stance seems to be that this is just a political thing, whereas actually I suspect it's much more driven by these, these institutions wanting to stay relevant for their customers and provide the products that their customers want. And that's where I kind of struggle because obviously the the key cornerstone of of American society is that, you know, 
businesses should be allowed to be independent and and should grow and it's it's sort of kind of that you know non-interventionist state view I mean driven by the market and what the market wants um and I think that's what this is I don't think it's a conspiracy theory but you know no I could be wrong yeah look I I agree with you and I think what's really interesting is when you're picking stocks to put into you know funds and all of these types of things I think you know companies that are built in a way that's sustainable that do good by you know like the society in which they operate that have a view on their impact on the climate I actually think that's a really good indicator of future success so actually for me when you start looking at what I call those sort of strong business fundamentals actually picking those types of stocks that you know align with a what we what Mr Barr called it an an ESG agenda I actually think are more likely to perform well over time right and I think actually his view is just a little bit too basic you know it's linking it to climate change as what he would term a political agenda rather than actually like you you said Kate these businesses doing their job well and doing right by customers Douglas what was your what was your thoughts on this one I mean, there's so many ironies within it. It's, it is, as you said, Ross, you know, you throw your hands up in the air and you could sigh because it's a, a politician, um, a lawmaker decrying politics getting involved in banking and he's inserting himself in banking by offering up this statement. And I completely agree with both your points in the fact that, you know, and another irony is, is obviously in, in America, the Republican party, the, the party of free enterprise and these companies, these private enterprises are, as you said, Kate and Ross, you know, following customer demand to offer up new products, not even replacing products, offering new products, that suddenly this is now an issue. And the amount of ironies there is, is absurd. But I mean, really, it also forgets the other two letters, you know, the social and governance. Um, and so much that is on top of that. If obviously Mr. The Republican, um, Andy Barr wants to focus on just one of the letters, I feel like if he's going to insert himself like this, he really does need to address the other two as well. Yeah, I completely agree. I found it quite an eye opening experience when we watched another subcommittee interview Mark Zuckerberg in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal and how little they knew about the sort of social media more generally, but then of course, like the business model and all of that sort of stuff. And this is doing nothing to sort of um, ease my concerns that these are the people that are setting, you know, influencing regulations and setting the agendas within financial services and all that sort of stuff from a political sense. Um, Tom, I mean, how much impact do you think this is going to have? Do you think this is going to sort of like derail ESG efforts in the US? I don't know about the US, but I mean, for, for me, in, in terms of speaking from a you know employee of a UK bank, this is really quite simple. You know, here you know, banks are first uh, charge holders over substantial portions of UK land and real estate stock, with the source of finance for most industrial infrastructure and property development, and we've got interest in underpinning valuations of this property and activity. That's not woke. You know, some of this is jeopardised by climate change, and you know we need to support the the, the net zero transition. I think, you know, to, to give you an idea of the scale of the challenge in our economy um, to reach net zero, you know, the emissions just from running and heating our homes are greater than the emissions of Nigeria. It's got a population of 185 million people. And that's a problem that banks can solve. And I think increasingly you'll see a backlash against firms that, that look the other way. And you know, one of my personal highlights certainly last year was that you know, Atom were the first UK bank to sign the UN's um, Climate uh, Neutral Now Pledge. So that's a, you know, it's a voluntary agreement to become carbon neutral and you know we want to go beyond that as well we, we've got an internal commitment to to become a carbon positive business by 2035 and that will involve you know committing to taking more carbon out of the environment than we're responsible for admitting and to do that it's it's product innovation it's funding sustainable business activities it's investments in the renewable uh, sector it's helping um, provide the finance for retrofit products for residential mortgages your know, finance can and should be a force for good I think that's what's been lost yeah, it has been lost. You're exactly right. Um, and such an important call out. And then I guess just to inject a little bit of balance, um, I guess, Kate, like this this, this topic will always be politicised, 
rightly or wrongly. And I guess there there have been elements of how it's been rolled out, how it's been implemented that we've got wrong. And of course, there have been some challenges around like greenwashing and 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 all of that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, not perfect by any stretch, right? No, absolutely not. And yeah, I think yeah, the points around greenwashing are completely, completely valid. Um, we know there's still a long way to go to kind of really, as Tom says, like, see through the fundamental change that needs to happen throughout the industry and it's not kind of it's not all on banks right a lot of it is is about the infrastructure that they also access and they're also dependent on so it's like a huge societal wide change that we need to go through um i think some of the things that i'm most excited about so far this year are you know, the the ongoing you know, investment interest that we are seeing in climate tech obviously we are biased towards fintech on this show and we love to see innovation in financial services but it seems like there's now real momentum behind investing in supporting kind of climate tech businesses. So, um, yeah, I think that potentially will, will help drive this. You know, we'll hopefully be in a position where, you know, to, to some of the Republican points, but I'm assuming that their their issue really is that you know, they talk about it being a, a cancer on our capital markets, i.e. like I'm assuming they're just not making as much money off these funds as, as they were previously when it was all going into oil and guns and things like that. So hopefully maybe if, if climate tech takes off and 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 becomes a more commercially uh rich part of 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 our society then um that will that will help appease republicans but yeah there's there's so many nuances to this um we just really recently actually recorded um a a show about sort of financial crime and that really opened my eyes to you know, the impact of environmental crime as well and how that is driven hugely by by financial crime the sort of independencies between the two so i'm really hoping one that we see like the evolution and progression of esg as as a space but also that we can kind of try and stitch the two together and, and try and think about how banks can help to support the environment by reducing environmental crime as well so that's that's been a really exciting thing for me to learn more about this week debate and it's just a shame that um republican only bar rather missed that Okay, now for the section of the show called Big Click Energy, a quick fire roundup of some more click-worthy news this week. Um, Kate, do you want to get us started? Sure, absolutely. So the first story in this section comes from Sifted, and that is that Monzo revenues have surged more than twofold, putting it on track for 2023 profitability. UK digital bank Monzo experienced record revenue growth in 2022, setting on course to achieve annual profitability by the end of 2023, according to an investor update seen by Sifted. Annualized revenue shot up 250% to 440 million in the 12 months to December 2022, a huge uptick from the 92% revenue growth to 154.2 million that the Neobank reported for the year to February 2022. Monzo now expects to break even this year, achieving a status that has, up until now, been extremely rare among Europe's neobanks. The bank has been cash flow positive, ingoings have outpaced outgoings, since October 22, according to the investor update. Yeah, this update follows off the back of reports at the tail end of last year that TSNL Monzo's CEO was telling a bank summit that he was expecting them to hit profitability in, in 2023, so um, not a surprise, but you know, it's great to see that they are still... Uh, seemingly on track for that although you know obviously it's interesting you know, the update they sent to crowdfunding investors talks about them expected to break even you know gonna break even make a profit i guess we'll have to wait and see um see kind of where they land but all in all the update makes a pretty upbeat reading you know monzo claim that they're averaging 150,000 personal account signups a month with over 350,000 customers now signed up to one of their two paid for plus and premium accounts and 200,000 business customers so you know, ever since i started working at 11fs fintech skeptics mostly but not exclusively working in incumbent banks, have used the fact that these banks aren't profitable to push back on the wave of change that we're seeing in the industry. But, you know, Starling is now profitable. I think Atom Bank is, is now profitable or on the path of profitability. Oak North is profitable. Alica Bank is profitable and now likely Monzo as well. And that's just you know, in the UK and I'll probably miss some as well. So I think, as we were saying earlier, you know, I think the conversation is really going to have to change. Those sceptics are going to have to find other sticks to to, to thrash around, um, and I'm excited to see what they come up with. All right. Um, our next one comes from City AM with a headline, Ashley's Fraser's Group set to roll out buy now, pay later product. Billionaire Mike Ashley's Fraser's Group is finalising a move to roll out its own buy now, pay later scheme, which will allow shoppers to borrow up to £2,000, according to reports. The new payments product is set to form part of a range of new financial products rolled out by new chief Michael Murray, 
under a scheme called Fraser's Plus, uh, that's reported by The Telegraph. Consumer loans will be facilitated through Studio Retail, a financial conduct authority regulated firm acquired out of bankruptcy by Fraser's last year. Whilst the BNPL payments will be facilitated by fintech startup Timeit, in which the retail group holds a 28% stake. Mike Ashley made his fortune as the head of Sports Direct, a popular discount athletic wear outlet store, and has been previously fined for failing to pay staff the national minimum wage. Um, Gosh, I think you'd have to question the timing on this one. Um, I think rolling out point of sale credit in an attempt to drive up sales and potentially encouraging people to spend more than maybe they can afford in the midst of the biggest cost of living crisis in a generation. Um, Yeah, I'll leave that one there. I think you need to question the timing for me. Okay, um, let's bring everybody back for the final section, uh, looking at a more lighthearted, a welcome, more lighthearted story from the last week. Um, So this one comes from Michigan Live. Uh, Michigan Boy 6 spends $1,000 on Grubhub. Uh, The doorbell just kept ringing and cars just kept coming. So a six-year-old Michigan boy went on a wild $1,000 spending spree like he was on a game show, using his father's Grubhub account, ordering large amounts of food from numerous area restaurants. The food piled up quickly for Keith Stonehouse while he was home alone with his son, Mason. We're talking five large orders of jumbo shrimp, Salads, shawarma, and chicken pizza sandwiches, chili cheese fries, ice cream, grape leaves, rice, and more. Stonehouse says he let Mason use his cell phone to play a game for about a half hour before bed, but he never thought that he would instead click on the Grubhub app and order large amounts of food from one restaurant after another. So much food had been ordered from so many different places that Chase Bank actually sent Stonehouse a fraud alert declining a $439 order from Happy's Pizza. However, the $183 order of jumbo shrimp from the same restaurant did go through just fine and arrived at the house. Now, we asked on the 11FS LinkedIn page, who should foot the bill? And we received more than 280 votes. 80% said the parent, so not a right lot of sympathy there. 14% said the app. 4% said the bank. And 2% said the device maker. Now, we did also have one vote for the child, um, which is very good. Um, I'm going to throw this out. Maybe, Kate, let's come to you first on this. Uh, I mean, it's a a great story as long as you're not Mr. Stonehouse with your $1,000 food bill. Yeah, this as as the owner of a one year old. Well, I mean that sounds weird. Sorry, as the parent of a one year old, um, this story really terrifies me because ever since, I mean, basically since birth, my son has been able to like scroll on a phone screen. Like it's actually terrifying the amount of technical competence that these kids have. Um, so yeah, I, I genuinely feel like this this could happen to me <laughs> like I, I do I don't have any any kind of uh, biometrics on my on my delivery account so um and I do spend a lot of money on food so I suppose from like a KYC like bank perspective would it be super easy for them to tell the difference if I ordered you know over 100 pounds of random food I, I genuinely don't know so I'm, I'm my main takeout from this is I need to go put more more um biometrics on my on my, all of my apps basically yeah, no, good point. I just love, I mean, $439 on pizza. I, w- I mean, Douglas, I'm wondering if they ate it all. <laughs> I, they certainly try, I imagine, but it, to me, it's, it just sounds like a Roll Doll novel. It it just, uh, it's almost fantasy. Um, and yeah, I think in today's age, you know, you can't tell the difference between now that the volume of payments are going up so much, and the value is coming down. How can a bank realistically go sift through every single transaction? And it's all through an app that the, I'm guessing he's used before if he's got it on his phone. So I really do side with the majority on this and the fact that you've got to fit, fit the bill to the parent because otherwise, gosh, you can imagine the amount of pranksters in the future that will just absolutely run riot using, you know, breaking these KYC and apps. I love I love the the rolled out comparison. I can see the Quentin Blake uh, illustrations of the confused dad <laughs> opening the door and the delivery man. Um, yeah, listen, Tom. I mean, picking up on on Douglas's point, um, 
do you agree with him? Like there's very little actually that the 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 banks or anyone else could have done here from like a protection or an authentication uh perspective, or maybe should we should we have seen a little bit more in this case? Yeah, I've got to say, when, when I read this, I kind of got a bit of PTSD because my uh, PFM open banking app of choice told me uh, at the start of January that I was in their top 0.01% of delivery users, <laughs> which is um, slightly worrying. So uh, I, I feel them. Um, I, I suppose you know, the, the question whether banks should reimburse the customers for an, author, an authorized transaction, I think you know, it's only if, if they haven't been negligent. And I think in this case, you know, I think that that's that's possibly questionable. Yeah, I'm a huge advocate of, of Apple Pay and, and of in app and device payments. I suppose it possibly brings into the question from a, a device manufacturer side whether you know positive friction or controls are required. Um, but it's a really tricky balance to strike. And, and as Douglas says, you know, actually sifting through uh, you know millions of transactions and, and trying to identify ones that are kind of fraudulent or suspect is is tricky. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. And look, it's not the first time we've seen it. You know, we saw in 2020, another child spent $16,000 on iPad game in-app purchases and, you know, these things these things happen. But um, yeah, he seems like a, a generous kid. So I guess, look, we're all ordering a <laughs> Bintech Insider post-podcast takeaway on Mason's dime. I'm going to go around the room. What's everybody, uh, what's everybody having? I'm going to start with you, Kate. Oh, I'm torn. Um I mean, I think like pizza is like normally my go-to, but still like one of my absolute highlights of pandemic life was I accidentally got, we ordered, I think some, some hacker like Mexican food on delivery and they accidentally sent us like the wrong household's order, which just happened to be like double the amount of food that we were going to order for ourselves, but like exactly the same dishes. So we logged it on the app and said, no, you've sent us the wrong, the wrong food. And they said, well, keep it we'll reissue the order and so we ended up with like three times the amount of food that we wanted to and they gave us all of our money back which I probably should not be broadcasting (laughs) but it was I I think just that experience has stayed with me and it's such a positive experience that maybe I should just I just want to get Mexican food just to just to live in that moment again. The fact that that happened and the disbelief on like the panel's faces as you're telling that story it's incredible. Um, Douglas what about you? I think I'm Really basic, but yeah, got to go Franco Mancas for uh, some some nice Neapolitan pizza. You know, you don't need a plate. <laughs> if you need a takeaway, yeah, you want to go as lazy as possible, right? Good choice. I'm going in for that $439 worth of pizza as well. Right? <laughs> um, Tom, final word to you. What are you having? Uh, Lebanese. Something, yeah. Something uh, a bit Middle Eastern. Yeah, really good choice. And I think a good note on which to end. Um, so that wraps up this week's news show. Thank you so, so much to today's guests. Um, guys, where can people find out more about you, Kate? Again, let's start with you. Best place to reach me is probably on LinkedIn, Kate Moody on, on LinkedIn. I'm also on Twitter at K8Moody. Excellent. Tom, how about you? LinkedIn again, uh, Tom Rennick, and on Twitter, uh, Tom underscore uh, Rennick 26. Excellent. And how about yourself, Douglas? Catch me, uh, uh, Douglas McKenzie on LinkedIn or um, Dougie Fintech on, on Twitter. Um, and obviously over at ffnews.com excellent excellent and as for me you can find me at Ross Gallagher 7 on Twitter and listen thank you so much for listening um, do join the conversation on social media or email podcast at 11fs.com thanks very much goodbye <laughs>